Okay, good afternoon, everybody. It is half the hour on Internet Standard Time. Do not adjust your dial. This is Dan Silverman. Um, set the in for Cheryl Dowd today, and we have begun the recording. Um, we're happy to have everybody for another coordinator call. Dan Davis, are you with us? I am. Okay, great. Okay, so Van, uh, before Van gets started with his presentation here on the Notice of Proposed Rules, I want to take 10 to 12 seconds to introduce Van. He is the new policy and planning consultant for WCET, so he's a new member of the team. We're really excited to have him. Uh, Van has a lot of experience in higher ed from faculty up to state regulatory work and has been a consultant to the STARS and anyone who's read Van's stuff or heard him talk on our previous calls knows that he knows this stuff as well as anybody. So um, Van, take it away. Thanks a lot, Dan. Um, so what I want to do is just take a few minutes to um, talk to you about uh, this first set of proposed regulations that the department has put out for public comment. And uh, you'll hear a little bit more uh, from perspective from Christina and then Dan's going to talk a little bit about um, the public comment process and, and when that ends. So you may remember uh, earlier this year we had this sort of unprecedented um, negotiated rulemaking process in terms of both the amount of things that the department decided to tackle in one negotiated rulemaking and how they went about doing it. Um, if you remember they actually because there was so much material they actually set up three subcommittees. And so they had um, folks appointed to the main negotiated rulemaking committee, which made the final decision on everything. And then they had people appointed uh, who were subject matter experts in these three subcommittees. And you also probably remember that uh, our very own Russ Fulin, um, who can't say no to negotiated rulemaking despite his best efforts, I think, uh, was selected to serve on the uh, innovation and accreditation subcommittee. And so it's that set of, or, or that subset of regulations, the, the innovation regulations haven't come out yet, but um, what the department decided to do is after they reached consensus, which I, I think it's fair to say none of us uh, expected that to happen, probably not even the negotiators, um, the department has decided that because the amount of material is so large, that they're going to partial, uh, uh, portion out uh, the uh, proposed regulations into three buckets. And so the first bucket that they have released has to do with accreditation and state authorization. And that's what's out right now for public comment. So I'm going to sort of hit the high points here very quickly. Uh, Russ and Dan and Cheryl, as always, have a great blog post over on the WCET, WCET Frontiers blog that really sort of breaks down the main issues on the state authorization side. Uh, Inside Higher Ed and Chronicle of Higher Ed um, both have some good coverage uh, on this process in general, including on the accreditation piece. I think that there's been probably more discussion around accreditation than state authorization um, because there have been some concerns expressed that the proposed accreditation reg re regulations could uh, water down the department's oversight. And I, I don't know, I, I'm, I don't feel that I'm, I'm competent to address that concern. I just want to make sure, though, that you guys know that that's out there. So real quickly, here's what um, the department is proposing around accreditation, the main pieces. The first big piece, and this does have a direct impact, I think, on distance education and online education, has to do about outsourcing. So you may remember that when the department put out um, their proposed regulations that they wanted the negotiated rulemaking committees to look at uh, back in January, they actually uh, were suggesting that 100% of a program be allowed to be outsourced. Uh, they scaled that back after pushback from the general public and negotiators. And so the proposed regulation now basically says that uh, an institution can have 50% of a program outsourced without needing to do anything. Um, if it goes over 50%, then the institution has to inform their accreditor, and the accreditor basically has this 90-day window. So it um, significantly increases 
the gate for when an institution has to go out to an accreditor, and then it also sort of puts some fences around um, the responsiveness of the accreditor. So that's that's a big proposed change that could impact online, or will most likely impact online and distance education. Um, and especially those programs that are using OPM. There's another sort of big change in the accreditation that could impact online education. And that um, changes in regulations around substantive change. The proposed regulations that the department has put out now would drop down the requirements for substantive change. So if an institution wanted to add a branch campus or wanted to increase the level of credential that they offer, those two things would no longer trigger substantive change for accreditors. That's kind of big. Now the branch campus piece probably isn't going to impact online education that much, but this idea that institutions might would not have to automatically get substantive change approval for increasing the level of credentials actually could have some impact on online and distance education if institutions decided that they wanted to offer new credentials um, at levels that they don't currently offer through distance ed. So that's another sort of significant change there. Um, there's a lot of other changes around accreditation. Those are the two that I think are probably the most important. Uh, for folks that are working with online and distance education. Uh, and then the other half of the proposed regulations the department has put out for public comment have to do with um, authorization and reciprocity. And so there's sort of four big areas here that are worth noting. And this probably isn't going to be new for most of y'all, but I think it's given that we're smack dab in the middle of the public comment period, um, it's good to sort of put these up at the top of, of, of your thinking right now. So the first one has to do with how, institu how institutions are supposed to determine the location of a student. If you remember, 2016 regulations, and this was something that WCET and SAN raised concerns about, the 2016 regulations talked about where a student is in terms of student residency. And residency can mean a lot of different things. Um, for example, and I'm going to date myself here, and I think the statute of limitations have passed too, so I should be good. When I went to graduate school um, at Vanderbilt in the early 1990s, I kept my residency in Texas so I could vote for Ann Richards again. Um, yet I lived full time in Nashville. And I doubt I was, you know, maybe my political reasons for doing that were unique, but I know I'm not the only one that did that. So what the department has done in the proposed regulations that are out for public comment is it's changed that language. It's no longer using that residency language, and instead it's using location language. And so the proposed regulations would require an institution to determine the location of a student when that student enrolls in the institution and then have a process and policies in place for students to inform an institution if their location changes. So gets rid of the residency language, which should hopefully solve some con possible confusion, and then put some requirements around when an institution determines location of a student, and then also put some of the onus on the, on the student following through with an institution's policies regarding change in location. So that's, that's the first sort of big piece on the authorization side. The second big piece on the authorization side is that the proposed regulations remove the 2016 language um, that requires institutions to document um, a state review process for complaints. And it um, removes that language because California doesn't have that process in place for institutions that it doesn't directly regulate. And that created some problems given the size of California. The third sort of big piece here on the accreditation, um, on the authorization and the reciprocity side um, is that the proposed regs retain the 2016 language around reciprocity. And that's, that's good news and bad news. It's great that reciprocity is um, retained as 
a viable pathway for institutions to fulfill authorization requirements. That's fantastic. You, remain, you may remember that. Uh, and here again, this is great work that Russ and, and Cheryl and Dan have done, uh, and then Marshall Hill over at NC Sarah. You may remember, though, that, that there was some confusion in the language that the department used around reciprocity, and specifically um, around whether or not reciprocity superseded or did not, and the department said reciprocity would not supersede a state's own regulations. And so this created some confusion about, well, if the state part of a reciprocity agreement, and they decide that they're going to still sort of use their own reg, doesn't that kind of kill reciprocity? And so you may remember that one of the last things that Ted Mitchell did before he departed Department of Ed back in uh, early January 2017 was clarify and say, no, 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 that wasn't our intention. Um, our intention is to preserve reciprocity, and we see that reciprocity is something that is between a state and a reciprocity agreement slash organization. And so when a state joins one of those agreements, they join knowing that they are agreeing to the regulations and the ground rules that that reciprocity agreement has in place. If it, and this is voluntary. So if a, if a state decides it does not want to play by those rules, then it can withdraw. Nobody's forcing a state to be a part of that. Um, what's unfortunate here, and again, this is something that, that Cheryl and, and Russ and Dan have done a really good job of outlining um, in their blog post, is that there had been hopes that some of that um, clarification language could show up in the regulation, and it hasn't. And so that language hasn't changed. There's every indication that the department hasn't changed its interpretation from that uh, letter that Ted Mitchell wrote, but that interpretation isn't in the regulation, and that could create some challenges in the future. Uh, and then the uh, authorization and reciprocity section also begins to tackle um, notifications and disclosures. And probably the really big, big thing here, the two big things here, First, uh, under the old regulations, institutions uh, were required to notify for adverse actions. That adverse action wasn't defined. So the department now has stopped using the word adverse and instead is using some very specific language that requires institutions to notify students um, around uh, investigations on academic quality, misrepresentation, and fraud. So a little bit more specificity there, a little bit more clarity. The other big, big piece, though, on the notification side has to do with professional licensure. And so the proposed regulations right now require institutions to disclose on the web the states that they meet requirements, licensure requirements for, states they don't meet the licensure requirements, and states they don't know if they meet licensure requirements or not. And, and those of you that have had to live in this world know that sometimes it's really hard to make that determination if the state meets, if an institution is going to meet the state licensure requirements. So that basic information would have to be posted on the web. There's another sort of two levels, though, of notification that are added here. Um, one is that if a student is interested in a program, the institution has to personally notify that student if this, their location does it happens to be in one of those states where uh, the program does not meet licensure requirements or they don't know if it meets licensure requirements. So there's a, another layer of personal notification. And then if a student enrolls in a program and the institution finds out it does not meet the licensure requirement or they don't know if they no longer meet licensure requirements, they must do a direct notification to that enrolled student within 14 days of that determination. So it adds a little bit more um, in terms of the levels of notification that are going to be required. It also is written in such a way that this is regardless of the modality. It doesn't matter if it's face-to-face -face or online. Um, I think Russ and, and, and Cheryl and Dan raise a really important point around this professional licensure notification. Notification is absolutely essential. There's no one that would disagree with that. Um, 
The department, however, has probably underestimated the amount of time that it takes states to determine if they meet licensure requirements, which for smaller institutions, excuse me, uh, I meant institutions to determine. So for smaller institutions that don't have a lot of resources, this could be a significant drain on resources. Um, and they also probably have underestimated the cost that's going to be associated with this. So um, in that WCET Frontier blog post, uh, Russ and, and Cheryl and Dan, and, and I would agree, um, my two cents here, is that these are absolutely solid, good regulations here, especially around licensure notification. But if you have concerns, you probably need to at least help the department understand the cost in time and money that may be associated with coming into compliance, especially if these are regulations that are going to go into, uh, go into effect on July 1st, 2020. And this is a change between those 2016 regulations that we're supposed to be operating under. So that is the really down, dirty, fast, high level overview of what this first, as the department is calling, bucket of regulations looks like. We don't know when the next two buckets are going to come out. Um, those two buckets are going to be around distance ed innovation, and then the other one's going to be uh, around uh, religious affiliation and um, grant program. So I know Dan's going to talk here in a little bit about how you can go about um, registering public comment, and uh, I will shut up and let uh, other folks smarter than me talk. Thank you, Van. Sorry, I was having a little trouble with my mute button there. Um, but um, I, I think you did a great job there and, and you, you drew well on your teaching experience. Um, does anybody have any, any questions for Van at this time? Okay, well, um, hearing none, we're going to move on to the next item on our agenda. So often when SAN programming or conferences or, or written works talks about SARA compliance, we, we, think about, we think about it from the institutional perspective, the state portal entity perspective, even the NC SARA perspective, but sometimes we don't give enough time and thought to the perspective of the regional compacts. So. As part of our efforts to address that, we have Christina Sedney on here today from WICHE, who handles the W. Sarah states and, it's, um, and handles that role as regional compact director for the Western states. Christina, um, take it away. Thanks, Dan. Can you all hear me okay? Yep, sounds good. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. I really appreciate it. So as Dan mentioned, I work with W. Sarah, which is one of four regional um, entities that work on W. Sarah. And I actually wanted to just sort of take it up to a really high level since regional compacts are actually quite unique and kind of interesting organizations. Um, so sort of give a bit of a baseline about what those are and sort of why they play a role in Sarah. So the most basic level of regional compact is really, you know, agreement among states for a specific purpose. So the regional higher education compacts, so for example, which is specifically our mission is to increase access to and the excellence of higher education in the West. Um, and so states are members, just as states are members of SARAs. And that relationship with the states is really sort of the key reason that we play a role in SARA. So when SARA was first starting, in order to, you know, kind of make the case to states that Sarah was important, in addition to having, you know, NC Sarah, this national group come into the states, they worked really closely with a regional compact. So that's Wichi in the West, and then we have three counterparts, as many of you know, so Nebi in the Northeast, MEC in the Midwest, and then SREB in the South. Um, so it really is kind of leveraging the long-standing relationships each of the regional compact had 
each of the regional compacts had within their states to kind of make the case for Sarah, not just again from a national perspective, but alongside an organization that really understood um, both the state's unique context, their unique regulatory atmosphere, and also had relationships really in a, many different areas. So. Regional compacts typically have relationships with the state's governor, with the legislature, also with the SHEO and higher education department, and then also with institutions. As you know, many uh, regional compacts offer um, undergraduate exchange programs and tuition reciprocity agreements and things like that. So they tend to have relationships with institutions as well. So they have this really unique set of relationships at the state level. And so that was really critical in kind of getting Sarah off the ground. I will take a moment to mention here, as I think many of you know, actually not all states our members of Sarah, we still have California, so that that's actually still part of my role is bringing states on board, and that is something we're working on, and I'm happy to speak more about that later if you have any questions. Um, and then in addition to California, the U.S. Pacific Territories and Freely Associated States are also WICHE members, and so should they be interested in joining Sarah, we would work with them as well. And so, Again, the regional compacts initially kind of came onto Sarah in that role to help bring states on. And then they also play a role that I think is perhaps in the background, as Dan mentioned to many of you, um, but in the ongoing implementation of Sarah. And that's really, again, related to that relationship with states. So Sarah really operates in kind of a, a four tiered structure. So as you know, the institution, as the institutions, you obviously are offering the distance education and you are authorized to do that by the states. And so you, you know, apply to the state to become a part of SARA. However, states actually are also authorized to become parts of SARA. So they, they are members of SARA. And so we are the group that works to make sure that the states are meeting the requirements that they need to, to be a part of SARA. And you can actually, if you go on the NC SARA website, um, just where they have the institutional application, you can also see they have a state application to join SARA, and you can see the specific requirements that states have to meet in order to participate in SARA. And just as institutions have to um, you know, reapply every year to be a part of SARA, states actually biannually apply to maintain their membership in SARA. And so they do that through what we call regional steering committees. So the regional compacts work with representatives from each of their states, um, which create the steering committee, and they will review any new state's applications to join SARA, um, and then also do the membership renewals as well. And so the goal there is to make sure that, you know, we certainly understand that every state is different in terms of its, its regulatory capacity, um, and then also, you know, how they do things in the state, the resources they have available, but we want each state to be comfortable with every state in SARA's processes. And so that's why we have the state group every year or sorry, every other year, renewing states' practices. Um, the Regional Steering Committee also serves a couple other key purposes. Uh, they help to provide a forum for states to provide feedback to NC Sarah. As you know, it's sort of institutions and states who are really sort of doing all that on the groundwork. And so that's who, um, you know, is, will really see if there are any practice issues related to NC Sarah policies. And so that's sort of a forum for us to collect those. And then finally, it's an area for us to really foster regional collaboration. So, you know, say we have a state that does a really good job handling student complaints via SARA, so we can have them share their practices with other states as well. So the steering committee offers that, that ability as well. And so we think that's really important. So again, not, not something that's necessarily, you know, something that would pop up a lot in your day to day, um, but that's sort of what's going on on behind the scenes at the state level from the regional perspective. And so I'm happy to take any questions if you have them. Well, Christina, I have a question related to what you just said at the end there about how it doesn't necessarily, the, the regional compacts role doesn't necessarily pop up on the day to day. But are there examples of, of a question that you would like to hear more of from the institution or you know, do you, do you ever get something where you say, well, that should have gone to your state or that should have gone to NC Sarah? You know, how, how is the, um, the dialogue going between the institution level and the compact level in your, in your limited time in this job? <laughs> sure. Thanks. Thanks, Dan. So there are a couple, and actually I would say you probably don't want to be in a situation where you're working directly with us, although you can be. Um, the two situations where that would most likely to 
be happening would be if you are if your institution is put on provisional approval to join NC Sara, the regional compact staff, um, so myself or W Sara, uh, needs to sign off on that. And so you'd be working with us in that situation, potentially, although always through the state. Um, we try in everything we do at the regional level to make sure it's in conjunction with the states um, rather than, um, you know, working around the state. So everything we do with an institution, we will also include the uh, state portal entity as well. Um, and then also if a state portal, uh, sorry, if an institution applies to join SARA um, and then they are not approved by the state portal entity and they have concerns about how the state portal entity applied SARA processes, they can bring that concern to the regional compact as well. So that there is that um, method of interaction as well. On that said, we're always, you know, you can feel free to reach out. We're always happy to talk. Um, I think many of you know that NC SARA are the, the ones who are responsible for setting SARA policy. Um, and so, you know, that's not the role of the regional compact. Ours is just to ensure states are meeting SARA policy. Um, so any sort of overall policy questions would go to NC SARA. Great. Um, Christina, I don't know if you can see in the chat, we have a question about regional compacts working with the Department of Ed. Are you able to see that? Oh, yes. Um, I would say, well, we're in a little bit of a unique situation at Wichi, I think, as you know, because we have WCET. I would say Wichi itself um, does less in terms of direct interaction with the Department of Ed, but WCET does a fair amount. And so Russ Poulin is both the executive director of WCT, but also which is vice president. And so I would say our primary interaction with the Department of Education is via WCET, who I believe they do look to as a trusted and guiding voice, and now also the SAN network as well. That's a good reminder as our invoices are coming due. Thank you, Christina. Um, any other questions for her? Um, I have one more. What in your relatively short time so far doing this job. It's been a few months now, I think. Have you, what has surprised you the most? I think perhaps the, um, and it shouldn't have been a surprise, given that Sarah itself is relatively new, you know, it's only been around for a few years, but I would say just the, the breadth of questions that come up, um, you know, it, you think you sort of understand everything and, and every possible scenario that, that could occur. And then there's always a scenario you never anticipated that can occur. So it's really that, you know, we're all learning how to work through these processes together and whether that's you know, Marshall Hill at NC Sarah, or Russ at WCET, um, you know, you can be the most experienced state authorization person in the world, um, but situations can still come up that, that stump everybody. And so we have to kind of work through them together. And I think, so that has sort of been the surprise, but I've also been really encouraged, I would say, by how willing I think everybody that I've worked with thus far has been to really jump in and um, try and work with the best interest of the students uh, at heart. And so that's been really encouraging to me. Great, thank you for your time. Um, does anybody have any, any other questions for Christina? Let's see, it looks like there's one more. Oh, okay. So Mary, Mary Larson is, oh, you guys can all read the chat. Um, so that's not a uh, question necessarily, but she's just reiterating that Sarah welcomes questions about Sarah, which NC Sarah does, which is of course, of course true. Um, okay, so thank you, Christina. We will now move on here. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the comment period. Um, one thing that was a little unusual about the comment period this time is it was only a 30 day comment period, typically, the department will go 90 or at the shorter end 60 days um, and 30 days is, is just really short. Um, so it's, it, I know it can be a little tough for everybody to get their comment together that quickly here at, at, at WCT SAN. We are, we're, we're almost done with ours, but we're not, we haven't quite finished ours yet either. And obviously with, with July 4th coming up, you know, I know I'm going to be making, daily trips to the fireworks store and all that. So, you know, it, it, it really is going to be um, going to be crunch time here. I think that the blog that we wrote that Van referred to so, so graciously is a good template if you're looking for some things about issues to comment on and some possible perspectives to take. Um, but of course, you guys have a lot of knowledge on the ground that will be really useful as well. 
Um, as far as the mechanics of commenting, um, I, I, I posted those into the chat uh, as, and it's also linked on in the blog post that's also linked on the chat. Um, but the, the, the simplest way to do it is through the portal that the department sets up. If you don't want to do that, you're probably your best bet is, is going to be snail mail. Uh, you can't email or, or sadly fax your comments in. So um, again, the portal is the way to go. There's instructions there on how to do it. Um, I think we're hoping to share our comment with the membership before we submit it. But again, this, it's taken longer than I think we were, I don't know if it's taking longer than we're anticipating, but it is taking a little bit of time to get that done. So I wouldn't, wouldn't wait for us uh, if you are planning to comment beyond what we, what we put into the blog post. Are there any questions about the comment? Um, I'm having a little trouble. Oh, Yolanda asks if there was a reason behind unusually short comment period. Um, the, none that was given, none that was given. Um, some people think that it's just because they don't really want to hear the comments as much this time. Uh, maybe that's a reflection of having reached consensus. They, 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 maybe they thought that there wouldn't be as many comments or questions. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure. But um, either way, it is a, it is a little bit um, it is a little bit unusual. And Van, you guys can read you guys can all read the chat. Uh, could be because there are still other buckets to come. Yes, that's that's actually that's an excellent point as well. Um, so if anybody has any other questions on commenting, um, another decision I guess that you will have to make as an institutional staff member is whether you wanna do it, your comment individually or on behalf of your institution. Obviously it can be a lot trickier on the, on the political side of your institution to comment from the perspective of your institution. Um, when I was in an, in an institutional level, I commented a couple times and both times did so as an individual. Um, not, I didn't even bother trying to um, work with our government relations office or any, anything like that. Uh, but as Russ is fond of reminding us, the volume of comments does does matter. So uh, we would encourage you. And I actually, I when I when I did it, it was partly I partly thought it would matter, but partly it was just kind of an exercise for me and advocacy and getting my thoughts together and trying to be trying to be somewhat persuasive or insightful. And anyway, I think it, it, it's, it, in other words, it can be a professional development thing too, if, if nothing else. Um, okay, next section here. We did not have any volunteers for, for this contribution of something you've learned recently. Um, I, did, I did cry for a few, a few hours, but um, I always stay hydrated, so my tears were, were easily replenished, and, and we'll, we'll do it next time or not. Um, the SAN podcast. Okay, so I posted that in the chat as well. The first one, the June edition, is, um, has been recorded and posted. Uh, we will be doing one in July and one in August. We don't know exactly what the format for the July one is going to be yet, but um, we encourage you to to give it a lesson. A listen, um, I guess a good podcast host would say, give us a five star rating. But we're not on any of those platforms right now, so you just mentally give us a five star rating. But any feedback you have, let us know. We want to get better. Um, as far as the announcements go, a couple of quick things: the Advanced Topics Workshop has sold out. So I should probably take it off this. That just happened this morning. Um, registration is open for the WCET annual meeting. There is a SAN coordinator meeting the day before the annual meeting starts. A lot of you have come to that. Uh, there's no charge for that. And you can attend that without registering for the WCET meeting if you would like. But, you know, if you're going to go all the way out there to Denver, assuming you don't, you know, assuming it's a trip, uh, might as well stick around, get a little insights from the other WCT areas. That's just my that's just my pitch. Um, I oh and an open forum um, in July will be about the Higher Ed Act, which could get reauthorized at some point and and kind of change this field again. So we will. Um, if I hear here, unless anybody has any other questions or concerns, anything that I missed.
All right. Well, that is all I have for today. Thank you all for your time and um, have a great rest of your week.